In today's episode on building a niche, I'm talking to my friend Tyan Marsink, who's building a 10 bedroom, 10 bathroom home in Branson, Missouri. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new, and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. And it's been a great couple of weeks. So I'm now down here in Gulf Shores, Alabama at Gulf State Park. As you probably know, if you've been listening to the podcast for any time, we have an RV and I like to spend my Novembers just catching up on the last of the summer warmth. Well, having said that, it is now 12 degrees and rapidly reducing today. We're actually got a freeze warning down here in Alabama for tonight. So a huge swathe of cold weather going across from way down in the west of Texas all the way up to the east coast. So it's been a while since I talked about the weather, but I actually like it. Um, we've had some really lovely weather down here and I always want to be outside. I want to be outside doing stuff. I want to be outside on my bike or walking. And it doesn't give me the time I need to get my work done. So a couple of cold and miserable days are just what I need to catch up on a whole bunch of stuff. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in London for the Host 2019 conference. That was an absolute blast. It really was. I wasn't sure what to expect from from Host. It was a brand new conference. It wasn't the sort of industry conference that I'm used to, you know, like VRMA and some of the industry company-led conferences. You know, there's a lot out there. Streamline do one, LiveRes do one, Guesty do one in Israel and Kigo do one. So, and of course, HomeAway's conference, which is, or Summit, which has just finished in Phoenix. Or was it Austin? Anyhow, that one's just wrapped up. And then there's Focusrite, and now Skift are having a conference. But this one was truly a conference for hosts, for owners, for property managers, and really what we had been wanting to do with the Vacation Rental Success Summit. But uh, the organisers of Host is a company called Terrapin, and they manage and create conferences on a whole range of subjects and they do this worldwide. So in any given year, they've probably got 20 or 30 different conferences going on, maybe more in different parts of the world. And they really know how to put on a conference. And I know for those of you who came to the last VRSS in San Antonio, you're going to say, well, you guys, you guys knew, you guys know how to put on a conference. But I think where Host won out and where Terrapin won out is that they had the ability to go out and find the sponsors and the exhibitors. And these are the people that actually pay to make the conference great. You know, we did three rounds of VRSS and just about broke even on the third one, but not quite enough to pay for the previous two. So it would be, I mean, we still haven't ruled out doing another VRSS, but we have to make sure that it's worth our while because you know, Mike put puts in about eight months of solid work for it. I tend to just turn up on the day and and do my thing, but for for Mike and for our company, it's it's a it's a huge investment, and we weren't really getting out of it anywhere near enough to cover costs. So, don't get me wrong; this is not a moan. It's just it it is what it is, and that's. One of the major reasons that we have been a little backward in coming forward to do the next uh, the next conference, I am sure there's going to be one. But anyway, back to host. It was excellent. There were a lot of exhibitors. There were over 200 speakers, 
and just the networking itself, you know, getting all the people in the industry together was an amazing thing. And at the end of, um, I'm going to play my interview with Tyanne in a moment. But when I come back at the end of that, I'm just going to mention a few people that I spoke to and spent some time with at Host and, and particularly some of my Vacation Rental Success podcast listeners. And it's so great to go to these conferences and have people come up and, and introduce themselves. I absolutely love it. I like nothing better than to just be approached out of the blue with somebody saying, I recognize your voice. I was standing behind you and recognize your voice. And I wanted to come up and tell you how much I love the podcast. Never stop doing that, folks. It does a lot for my ego, basically, because now if you saw me now, and I'm going to post a photograph, actually, of, of my, uh, my little studio here in the RV. I'm sitting here on my own, just talking into a microphone, not knowing who's going to be listening on the other end. And it is, it is just so encouraging and uplifting to actually hear from people in a live situation that, that they are enjoying the content that I put out. So yeah, never stop doing that. And I'll be mentioning a few of those people as we get to the end of this podcast. So Tyann Marsink was at Host 2019 together with uh, Andy McNulty. Uh, Tyann is the community ambassador for Touch Day and they had a tiny booth for Touch Day and did very, very well at the conference. Now, as you know, I endorse Touch Day 100%. I'm using it in every aspect of my business and I'm using it in a very new and unique way that I'm going to be sharing with you in an upcoming podcast. And it's to do with owner onboarding. For anyone who was at my presentation at the VRMA International Conference in New Orleans, you will have heard about this and you might have seen well, you will have seen some of my slides, which showed how I was using Touch Day to create an owner manual. Well, I've just about finished it now, and it's it's going to be shared out very shortly to all the people that came to that session so that they can see how they can create this guide for their new owners. So it's not just a guide for guests. We're creating a guide for owners. I'm also creating a new training course which will be announced in the next couple of weeks uh, for managers who want to grow their businesses. And I'm going to be using the Touch Day Guide as well as a sort of a, as a resource in that program. So Tyanne is community ambassador for Touch Day. She is also the owner of Branson Family Retreats and Missouri House. And Missouri House is a collection of five or six properties in more rural locations in Missouri. And Branson Family Retreats is a collection of three properties that she has built to accommodate large groups. And this latest one, which is a 10 bedroom, 10 bathroom property accommodating up to 32 people is soon, well, it's open for booking now and it should be completed early in the new year. So I wanted to talk to Tyanne about building for this niche. Now, you might not have a huge property, but as you have learned from the previous podcasts I did with Rick Oster of Oster Golf Houses and from Andy Reynolds from Villa Carpe Diem in Cyprus, this is about niches. It's not about the type of niche. Everybody has different niches. But just understanding how these people are creating their properties to suit a niche is really valuable information if you believe you you have a niche to share. So without further ado, let's move on over to my conversation with Tyann. So I'm super delighted to have with me today Tyann Marsink of Branson Family Retreats, which actually is just one of, uh, of your business ventures, Tyann, isn't it? It is, yes. It's kind of funny when people ask me about my properties. I'm like, well, I've got two brands. They're like, what? Two brands? <laughs> like, yeah, well, it's completely different target guests. So that's why I've got two. Okay, so you've got Branson Family Retreats, and what's the other? 
Missouri House, and then House is spelled the German way, H-A-U-S, because that is, goes back to my German heritage. Missouri House, which of, of which there are, are several houses, we've we've talked about before on a previous podcast, and I'll make sure that we put the episode number in the show notes so you can go and check on that. Because today I wanted to talk about purpose building a property for a niche market, and this is what you are doing in Branson. So could you give us a little bit of the background on the property you're building and why you're building it there? Yeah, so Branson is where we originally started back in 2007. So I've got 12 years of hosting under my belt, and this is the 13th year. We signed the contract the very first of July 2007 and immediately put our verbal listing up right away, um, used pictures from the model house. Uh, it got built in just a few months and immediately had our first guest the same day we walked out the door from setting it up. And we only gave ourselves five days to set it up. <laughs> and, and I had a two-month-old baby with me. So I was eight months pregnant, signed the contract, and then set this up with a two-month baby. And what uh, when we did that, it was one of the largest, larger houses in the area. It was a four-bedroom house, three levels with a family room, and we sleep 14 people when you include the sofa sleepers. And we were following what my parents had started doing. They had previous the previous year bought two houses, two five-bedrooms, and the same year we built ours, they built a seven-bedroom house just down the street, as well as another house. And they, they continued to build um, I built a five bedroom house two years later because my four bedroom was always booked, always had families. And as the trend it, it went, it, it's no longer a trend, but it's something people do now, especially with Branson. It's three generations of families coming together, meeting together, and they're choosing Branson because it is so easy for everyone to access. We're within a day's drive of half the population of the United States. So it's so easy for people to come in. Um, back when we first built ours, that's also when they put in the Branson Airport. So you can get direct flights from several major cities um, right into Branson. And then all the activities that, that Branson has just covers anything you absolutely want to do because it's the live music show capital of the world. We have more theater seats than Broadway in New York and we've got the largest theatrical stage in the entire country. On top of that, you've got a massive, wonderful lake, Table Rock Lake, and then you've got Lake Taney Como, which has world-class trout fishing. Then you add in the world-class golf courses. For instance, we host PGA tours and then you've got all kinds of nature going on because um, with conservation areas, uh, Beverly Hillbillies, do you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? I do. Their first episode was recorded in Branson over at Silver Dollar City. And Silver Dollar City is one of the top theme parks in the country and has one of the top 10 Christmas light displays in the entire country. Wow. So it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a year round destination. Pretty much, yeah. We run on Silver Dollar City's opening schedule, so spring break through the end of the year. And what's really awesome is Branson is built for groups. Restaurants expect groups. It's not a place where you come with your large family and then you're like, oh, we can't sit together. Oh, we can't go somewhere together as a group. All the businesses and all the restaurants expect large families to come and they welcome them to come in. So when, when you're talking about large families, what size, what, how many people are, is, is the average that, that come in um, as a group? Um, it, when you say large, you know, if you come from a small family, you think 15 people is large. Um, I am fielding inquiries for families of 60 to 100 people coming in. Oh, my goodness. Yes, that's normal. Very normal for this area. <laughs> that is that is amazing. So, so I I hadn't I had no idea about this until I talked about this with you last time, and you said that Branson mm -hmm. uh, is it the second most popular place for large group rental uh, yep, large large groups. 
According to TripAdvisor, a few years ago, they stated Branson is the second most popular destination for group travel. And that's more than just family reunions. It's also when your local bank puts together a bus tour and they bring everybody to a destination. It's Branson they're choosing. Um, It's behind D.C., um, but it was above New York City as well. Amazing. And And how how do you, when you're researching, when you were researching to start building, what, what sort of research did you do to establish how you were going to actually design and build the property for that niche? Well, since I've been in the niche with the four and five bedroom houses, um, I knew what people were asking for because there's times, times I couldn't fulfill the request. On top of that, both my um, parents and my brother also have large homes. So it's real easy to sit down at a family holiday dinner and swap stories and talk about what guests want or what they don't like and what worked and what didn't work. So uh, building this new place, which I don't think I even mentioned, it's um, 10 bedrooms, 10 and a half bathrooms. Um, When doing this, actually mom and dad built a 10 bedroom and my brother Michael built a 10 bedroom all on the same street. And we're not, even though we're direct competitors, we actually work really well together because we can't sleep all these groups together, you know, on our own. We have to have another house with us or two houses with us. So in doing the research, um, you know, looking at what my family's done and then also talking to the Chamber of Commerce and finding out Who is asking, who's calling up the Chamber of Commerce and saying, what kind of lodging do you have available? Those are the things we want to do. What's available in your area? And come to find out in talking to the Chamber, not only do they constantly field requests and refer um, travelers to different things in the area, especially, specifically, their Chamber of Commerce members, I found out they have a budget solely to attract large groups to come to Branson. So you've talked to the the chamber, which I, I suppose has has a tourist department, and was that was that a sort of major part of 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 deciding, you know, how many bedrooms you've you, you'd actually have? The number of bedrooms depended upon my my budget, my building budget. <laughs> <laughs> I went I went as large as I could possibly go. It, it sort of blows my mind a little bit, you know, building ten bedroom, ten and a half bathroom house. What I'm assuming you have more than one master suite then. All master suites. And that that was one of the big things. Everybody wants their own bathroom. So I said, well, that means everybody gets their own bathroom. And then we've got the extra half bath for the main level. So when you're at the kitchen or hanging out in the living room, you don't have to run to your bedroom, wherever it is, upstairs, downstairs, wherever. Um, So that was important to me. Um, The other two really important things this time was one, that it was wheelchair accessible. Because when you have a large family coming together and it's three generations, I've had a lot of four generation families traveling and me being part of that four generation family who likes to go places. um, My grandma needs to be able to get into the house in a wheelchair. So it's knowing it's important for us. And then I look at it like it's more, it's important for other people too. Tell me about kitchens about the size of yeah. the kitchen. Do do you find that people are, I mean, they must be doing some catering for themselves? Oh, yes, for sure. Um, it's got two large fridges, two stoves, ovens, two dishwashers. I mean, everything's pretty much doubled. And mm-hmm. then I've got a huge, long counter. Uh, you can. I'm going to put stools on one side, but the main purpose of this island counter is to serve as a buffet for families when they make their food and then everybody can sit together because the second question I always get from families is, do you have dining room seating for every single person staying at the house? They want to eat together. So you're building a a big dining table and then having the extra seating along the, um, along the counter space. Seems like, you know, if if you, how, how many, how many people is, is this, property going to accommodate? Let's start with that. So yeah, mine accommodates 32 people. Okay. So how do they get to eat together then? So there'll be, I'll actually have four, probably eight or 10, probably eight foot long tables. Um, I'll have them custom made. So they're, I don't like how wide a standard table is. We'll make it a little bit narrower and then they'll be lined up um, in two rows. 
Mm-hmm. And then you can also pull them out so that somebody can sit on sit on each end as well. So actually, when you by the time you include the bar stools at the counter, there'll be a few more seats than thirty two. Um, but this way, everybody can sit together, have a meal together, and they can rearrange. And the purpose of rearranging, being able to rearrange the tables, is I want to also um, focus on corporate retreats and mm-hmm. workshops. Because there's a lot of um, companies out there who want to hold workshops and corporate retreats and have a learning style area. So the great room, dining room is all together. It's massive. And you can rearrange things to make it work for that and put in a projector and a projector screen. I love that idea, that uh, dual purpose uh, type of um, rental space. So you've got your, your families coming on a... Uh, get together type of vacation, and then the corporate style of space. I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in the whole design of the place. What about oh, car parking? Let's go outside. What's what's how how, how do you cope with all these travellers coming in in different vehicles? Because we are um, in a vacation rental community, specifically houses built for vacation rentals, um, they were very good about setting up enough parking for each and every house. So it's, you know, written right into the site plan to have massive parking amounts. So you've almost got you know, a custom car park. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, and then the um, outdoor pool is right down the street. And then the indoor pool is right below us. Okay, when you say outdoor pool down the street and indoor pool below us, that's, that's, that's um, community pools? Yes, community pools, yes. This is interesting. So I, I wanted to... to touch on the whole permits and plans and uh, how difficult that was. But um, as as you said, it's in a community where properties are built just for rental. So uh, assuming that you don't have regulatory issues that that would perhaps impact people who are, are just buying a piece of land somewhere and hoping to build. Correct. Yeah. I always make sure I'm in a place that is already friendly to vacation rentals. Uh, Branson thrives on vacation rentals. When I told the chamber what I was doing, they were ecstatic because they get all the phone calls asking for large houses to stay in. And so they're, they're very, very excited that this development was happening. Uh, development was is put through all the county permits, the city permits, of course, for building. And we're actually on the very edge of city limits. And as soon as it's finished, it will be incorporated into city limits. Um, And then Branson does have an additional tax on lodging within city limits. So then they're going to get some extra money too. It's, it's only 1%, but it's something. Here's another thing. All these, I, these things are just coming to me while I'm talking to you. And I'm thinking, um, (laughs) How do you, how, with, with all these properties, with all these large properties that have changeovers, how do you get the people to do these changeovers with, if you're in an area which thrives on vacation rentals, there's lots of them, where do you get the people to come and do the cleaning and the maintenance? Because turning over a property after 32 people who walk out the door has got to be a very, very big job. It is a big job, and the reason I'm comfortable with it is because our cleaning company that we use is phenomenal. Um, She's been doing – it's a family-run business. Um, Her children work for her, and they, of course, hire extra people during the summer. They do laundry off-site, and we do have a small checkout list that we ask guests to do. Um, all dishes need to be done and dishwashers started so that the cleaners can just put dishes away. Um, trash has got to be taken out. It cannot be left in the house. Um, what smells besides, you know, just transporting things. Um, and the neighborhood does have a large dumpster, dumpster, so guests just need to walk it down there. And we do ask our guests to strip the beds. Um, my smaller properties, I don't ask that, but with the larger properties, because of time, it's necessary to ask them to do that. How, how many people does it take? You, you know, I haven't seen <laughs> them clean a 10 bedroom. I can t- I'm, just, I'm gonna assume it's twice as long as my five bedroom. And they can knock out my five bedroom house in four to five man hours. 
I always am blown away with what you achieve, Diane. <laughs> you know, you, you never stop. You never stop. And, and, and this, is, this is, sounds like such an, an, an exciting addition to what, uh, what you're already running. And I know we've, we've talked uh, on other occasions about workflow and, and the importance of that. So I'm not going to touch on that. But I just want to ask you a little bit about um, marketing and advertising this, this type of property. What sort of proportion of um, of your advertising goes to the online travel agencies, the OTAs, and how much do you do direct? So far, most of it's been direct. I've only had, I mean, I'm already taking bookings for next year. I'm already fielding inquiries for 2021 and 2022. And the house, obviously, is still no siding on it, <laughs> no furniture. It's just framed. Um, and that's how much demand there is for it. Uh, my biggest uh, marketing has been being part of the local chamber of commerce. That is huge when you're talking about um, a large place like this. Um, they're sending me inquiries or requests for proposal um, RFPs um, weekly, which is really nice. And so, you know, several items a week. Um, OTAs, I've got one booking from OTAs. Everything else is direct. Um, and then my past guests. So, so since I've been doing this for so long, my um, past guests, their family is growing also. And they've grown out of my smaller houses to a point of they're looking at, well, I think we might need to book both your houses next time for Thanksgiving. So immediately when I let all my past guests know, hey, this next year we're going to have a 10-bedroom house, they're like, oh my gosh, we need to know when because we're ready to book Thanksgiving and we need that big house. So it's, it's really great to see how that uh, my guest family, families are growing the same as we are growing. And it's great to hear how much booking direct you're doing. Of course, it, it does help that, I guess, people with, who have those specific needs for such large properties do tend to book, as you say, way, way in advance. And mm-hmm. and I think you know probably a bit tougher to find that sort of property just out on Airbnb. So you've mentioned before that that you work close, and this is really interesting to me that you work closely with the Chamber of Commerce because I know that you did in Marthasville when you renovated the bank house, mm-hmm. and you were there front and center with the Chamber of Commerce right at the outset, letting them know what you were planning on doing, and then you just said you've done the same thing here. How mm-hmm. how important? Is, do you think that is? I think it's massively important. And it's massively important to not only be making sure the chamber knows what you're doing so they can help support you as one of the chamber members. So you want to become a member, obviously. But the other thing is be really, really good friends with the person who greets visitors at the door. So when I first went to the Chamber of Commerce in Branson and introduced myself, I made sure um, that I connected with Kim. And Kim's the person who greets every single person who walks through that door. And what's amazing is, you know, we connected personally and became friends as well. So it's, you know, I always try to be friendly, but it's awesome when you become friends with someone too. Mm-hmm. So whenever somebody walks in and says, Hey, we're going to have a family reunion. You got any suggestions? You know, it, my place is top of mind immediately. I love that. And I think most people wouldn't think about that. They would just simply think it's, it's just almost a referral network and, and forget about the personal relationships that can take those networks even further forward. Exactly. And, and it's awesome. I mean, Kim has shared, does home sharing on Airbnb with her place there. So next time I get down there, um, just to check on my place, um, I, I looked last time, I'm like, Kim, your place is already booked. So hopefully this next time I'll get to stay with her and we can, we can chat more on hosting and things like that. Um, but I, one of the big things I've always said is relationships are important. And even though I'm, I live three and a half hours away, you know, I can still build relationships with the Chamber of Commerce and um, with the people in the area and be very cognizant of, of doing that because you're working as a team in the tourism industry. So anybody I talk to in the Branson area as well who, who think, oh, well, Chamber of Commerce is like, yes, join them. You know, look for that because their whole sole purpose 
is to support the local area businesses. So why would you not, as a vacation rental property, join them? Yeah, such an important point. And I think it's one that many people would probably miss, I think. Tyann, if you were to advise somebody else who was thinking of purpose building a property, what advice would you give to them based on you know your own experiences? Uh, always run the numbers, run, run how much it would cost you and conservative what would be coming in, your expenses going out and then add ex- extra expenses and see if the numbers work first because we can always have exciting ideas and want to run with something. But in the end, if the numbers don't work um, or if the numbers don't um, come to y- your definition of success, then you're going to have, you're going to really struggle. And my definition of success might be different than someone else's. Maybe someone else just wants enough to cover their cost of owning the property and then they can visit it a lot or eventually retire in the home. Whereas my success um, definition is I am preparing for my retirement later and I want to get my house paid off with the income that comes in and so that I have a retirement. This is my investment for later in life. Yes, in, indeed. And what, oh, what sort of occupancy are you looking at from this property? I, it's it's going to vary, but generally I run around 60% over the year mm-hmm. because um, we do have lower occupancy in the dead of winter. But with this property, I'm going to shoot for a little bit higher than that during the winter because that is the prime time that churches have retreats out there and corporates. Um, business have retreats out in Branson area. We're right next to the Chateau on the Lake, which is a larger convention attraction. Um, They hold a lot of business conferences. So I'd like to be able to attract the people that look at the Chateau and the Chateau is too big for them. um, And they want a smaller venue and I'm happy to have them nearby. So it's so important to understand who your guests are going to be before you start running the numbers. Yes. For sure, because then they're going to also have different price points that they're willing to pay. Yeah, how do you establish that? How do you establish um, those those price points? Um, I look at what the competition is doing, what everybody's doing, and seeing what the market will bear, and talking to people how um, what budgets generally are uh, for guests coming to this area. And so I've, I've priced my place a little bit different than what I would normally, what I normally do. So my smaller houses, I can get away with a five night minimum, seven night minimum only, um, and having a flat rate during the week and then the weekends go up a little higher. Mm -hmm. What I found with the larger houses, I've dropped the minimum to only three nights because think about it when you're around 25, 30 other people, how long can you be with them with, with how going insane or starting arguments. And I, we, even with my own family, I love them dearly and we get together every Memorial weekend. But by the third day, third night, I'm ready to go home to my own place. Mm-hmm. And just understanding that with family and dynamic relationships, um, I made sure one, there is space for families to be separate also in my property. So they have their own established space. So there's a family room downstairs, a great room upstairs and a large bedroom for families. And then of course the outdoor spaces, the deck is massive, but dropping that minimum night, because when you're talking that many people, not only they're ready to go home to their own beds and their own houses and their own spaces that they're familiar with. Also, um, it's just plain difficult to get that many people together for more than a couple nights. So back to the pricing question, you come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights when people generally have to have to work and they can't take off. That's your best rate. Mm -hmm. That is low. And then on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that is really high. Not quite double, but it's high Um, because that's when the high demand is. So, you know, once again, it's all about knowing the market. It's knowing your market inside and out and understanding what the, what the market will bear. Um, and that's going to have the, um, the impact on what you eventually build. So it's all, it all seems to do, there's all these pieces of the puzzle, right? 
Yes, for sure. The puzzle pieces and they're moving and you have to adjust and be flexible and it's fun. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it. There is one final question. I, I asked this of, of Rick Oster when we were talking about his golf houses, um, uh-huh. about furniture. Because he was saying that when he started, he went lower quality on his furniture uh, and mm-hmm. he paid the price. And mm-hmm. he put in things like he put carpets in bedrooms and paid the price. Mm-hmm. And as, as mm-hmm. he went over the years and built more properties, he learned from each one. What have you learned from some of your earlier projects, building projects that you are, um, that, that are now informing the way that you're building this current property? Same thing, except I did not make the mistake and go cheap. <laughs> I did nice furniture. Um, my original houses have the original furniture in them. The same couches, I get them cleaned. They're taken care of. The same dining sets, they're solid wood. The thing is that the smaller properties, you can do the cheaper stuff. They don't get as much wear and tear. But once you get bigger and there's more people, they are very, very rough on things. And so I go for the good quality that can be repaired if necessary and will last. And yeah, my my budget to set up a house is probably double what other people's budget is. But you can tell by even just looking at the pictures that everything is well taken care of and um, it lasts. Yeah. That, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Because I, I think that's, that's really important. I know when I first came out to Canada and, you know, in, in my awe of cheap stuff, when I came out from England to Canada back uh, nearly 20 years ago to start doing this, I, I just bought everything cheap. It was so cheap. And I thought this is amazing. Yeah. And then found within six months of um, vacation rental use, it all had to be changed. There is, I, I don't think there's, there's any room for real economy in furnishing. You've got to re- furnish robustly and for the market, for the use it's going to get, which is a lot more harder use than it would in exactly. your residential home. Yes, exactly. And I also look for commercial grade items too. Yeah. Um, Tyann, thank you. This is, this is so enlightening. And, you know, for, for anybody who's out there, um, listening about purpose building a home, I'll put a link to Branson family com on the show notes and go take a look at, at that. And I know if you've got any comments or questions that, uh, that Tyann will be more than happy to, to come along and, and help you out on that. Um, as always, Tyann, I'd always like to give you an opportunity to just briefly mention VR Mastered because, you know, you, you're out, you, you do this, you walk the talk on a, on a constant basis. And you also have a course that, uh, that helps people to set up a business in the way that you do. So just tell us about where the next one is. Yeah, thank you, Heather. So the next one is um, October 24th to 28th. It's in St. Louis, Missouri this year. We move it around each year. And we have um, our instructors, of course, me, and then Alana Schroeder, the distinguished guest, Jess Vosel of Guest Hook, Nancy McLear of Anna Maria Island, and Conrad O'Connell with Build Up Booking. And since this will publish after this coming Tuesday, I will also tell everyone that um, we are adding Erica Muller with Rolio to talk about investment strategies and how to invest and add to your portfolio. And then we have a seventh teacher. We're going to release um, that in a couple weeks after. And I think we might be almost sold out. I mean, maybe a handful of seats left. So um, if anybody's interested, let us know. Uh, website's vrmaster.com. We keep it very, very, very small because it's so interactive. Uh, five days, intense training and learning and doing. And that's the biggest differentiator from other conferences is you're doing things. Um, you're not just listening to people talk. Fantastic. I'll make sure there's a link in the, uh, in the show notes to that. So, uh, so everybody can go take a look and, and I know this has been running for a couple of years now. It's hugely successful. Mm-hmm. And I know that you have people coming back over and over again. We do. We have 13 alum this year. 13. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. And yes. And the, and the feedback is always amazing. So, so yeah, 
Thank you for all you do for the industry, Tyann. It is completely invaluable. Uh, anyone who who has a question on anything to do with this business, um, ask Tyann and she'll have an answer for it. And, and if I don't know, I know who has the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks once again for joining me. As always, an absolute pleasure to have you. You're very welcome. Thank you, Heather. So if you're listening to this on the day of publication, then you will be aware that uh, we have gone beyond the dates of the VR Mastered course. Uh, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get this one out before the course ran. However, just information on VR Mastered is is really good. They run the course once a year. I think Tyann might be considering doing it um, more often. But uh, you need to get in touch with Tyann if you'd like to go on the wait list for the 2020 VR Mastered. Each year it grows bigger and I have heard nothing but amazing feedback from it. So if you know if you're up to five dedicated days, what you'll come away with is a mass of knowledge and friends for life. I know this because I have met so many people who've done VR Mastered and they have remained friends I and mean, close friends with many of the people that have been on the course. And as Tyann said, there were 13 alumni on this last VR Mastered course. And these are people who come together every year now to meet up and network once again with each other and to also make new friends. So they become almost a, you know, a self-monitored mastermind group afterwards, keeping in touch with each other, keeping each other accountable. And, and it's a hugely valuable thing to be doing if you're just starting out in this industry or if you want a little bit of a reset. Talking about that, if you're just starting out or if you want to reset, I'm just going to give you a little taster of what's coming up in the spring. I am currently putting together a 12-week course for property managers, for small property managers. If you're just starting out, you're just starting to manage other people's properties. Now, this could be as a co-host because if you've listened to my previous podcasts, you know that I consider co-hosting to be property management. And your insurance company and any of your guests' insurance companies will also consider you a property manager as well. So you need to make sure you're properly insured. That's another topic. However, as a co-host or as a property manager, you can't just jump into it and do it and expect to be successful. I know this. I've been doing this for 17 years and I made a ton of mistakes at the outset. And I'm seeing people making very, very similar mistakes right now. People who have just started to manage properties on behalf of others because they've sort of fallen into it. And they're doing it without really the, the, the full knowledge of what it all entails. So I wanted to put together a course that covers every aspect of creating a successful property management business. And I'm not going to say a huge amount more on this episode. You're going to hear a little bit more as we go through into the rest of uh, November, December, as I publish new episodes. And I'll add a little bit more as I'm beginning to develop the course. But it's going to be spectacular. I know this. You're going to get full access to me. You're going to get access to a large number of other industry experts, people that you can connect with directly on different topics, whether it's digital marketing, whether it's social media marketing, whether it's choosing a property management system, whether it's hiring staff. We are going to go through every single element of growing a business. And when you come out of it at the end of the 12 weeks, you will have all the tools you need to move forward with real confidence that you can make a go of it. So I'm going to come back to that probably next week and the week after that. But you can, if you go to support at Vacation Rental Formula, you can let us know if you'd like to go on a wait list because I am limiting numbers uh, for this course at the outset. I want to make sure that everybody really gets full value from it and gets full connection with me and with my advisors so we can't take on a massive number of people 
So if you'd like to go on the wait list, then definitely go to support at vacationrentalformula.com. Mike and Jason will be creating a landing page before very long that you'll be able to go to and register your interest. It doesn't mean you're not asking for any money from you at the moment. Just go register the interest. It means you'll be the first to know when the course is out there and ready for registration. So a little bit back on host 2019, just a shout out to some of the people I'm met. My favourite people were there, you know, Tyann and Andy, Evelyn Badia, who I have connected with online and once or twice in person. But I got to spend just about three days of in Evelyn's company. We went we went shopping together, we went to Covent Garden, we strolled the streets, we went to pubs. And this is one very beautiful lady. I love her to bits. And she's going to be coming on the show very shortly. So if you don't know Evelyn, she is the host of the Hosting Journey, which is the Facebook group and the podcast. So a fellow podcaster and also incredibly like-minded. We just got on like a house on fire and I, I loved it. So looking forward to having her on the show. And then I talked to Steve Milo. I mean, a lot of people who've been on the podcast were there. Steve Milo, Dana from Virtual Concierge, uh, the team from Beyond Pricing were there. Not Ian McHenry, who I talked to a, a week or so back, um, but the rest of the team. And I also got to talk to a number of uh, podcast listeners, which was absolutely fantastic. Now, for this episode, because of my location and because I, I have not been able to sort through all the business cards and all the connections, uh, the notes I made just yet. I can't give them a call out by name as yet. I'm going to do that in future episodes. One who I did met was Josephine Murphy, who managed her property called Chestnut Hill Cottage in the US, but she's a Brit moving back to the UK. Uh, I hope, Josephine, that, uh, that you carry on in the vacation rental business when you get back to the old country and that you keep in touch. It was an absolute pleasure meeting with you. I met a lady very briefly who said, I am your fan from Norway and I didn't get your name. So I'd love you to send me an, an email, my fan from Norway and at uh, heather at vacationrentalformula.com and, and just remind me, let me know who you are so I can give you a shout out. And from, for my listener from the Canary Islands, from Gran Canaria, I am so sorry I don't have your name to hand and I'm going to talk to you on the podcast next week when I do have that. But thank you so much for coming up and saying hello in Como at Vacation Rental World Summit. And, and again at host, it was an absolute pleasure meeting with you. And there's several others I want to give a shout out to and we'll definitely do so next week. So that's it for now. This is the first episode I have recorded from the RV uh, on this very windy, stormy, cool day in Alabama. Loving the fact that I have to stay in stay indoors today. So uh, I will be doing some more. We'll be doing some recording over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to spend a day with Amy Hynote at, uh, at her home in Fairhope. So that's going to be fun. So you will be hearing about that too. But for now, I think I am just about done. So it's, it's as ever, it's been great being with you and I will be with you again next week. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.